Okay, it's a pleasure to introduce Ruben Wang from MIT and MSRI. We'll talk about how round is a shorter curve. Okay, thank you very much for coming. Uh, I'm really happy to be here in person and give a talk, and also surprised to see that the weather here is not uh, uh, colder than in Berkeley, where I just flew from. Uh, so I will stay here for the whole week. And uh, I'm really glad if any, if any of you have any questions to come to chat uh, with me at any time. Uh, my office here is a 2.20. All right, so today I'm going to talk about how round is the Jordan curve and I will be working in two dimensions and the curves are really curved in one dimension. And two dimension surface, I only consider the sphere, the simplest one. And uh, a golden curve is simply a, a simple loop on the Riemann sphere. And when I asked how round the Jordan curve is, I was thinking about using a quantity to measure in the roundness of that. Uh, what you would expect is that a circle should be the roundest curve, and all circles are equally round. And there is a conformal transformation, the group of a conformal transformation. So this is the PSL 2C group, which acts on this Riemann sphere. So this is represented by this, this two by two matrices with complex entry and determinant one. And uh, we'll model out uh, any matrix the same as this. Uh, so how does that act? It acts on the Riemann sphere by the fractional transformation. So this is simply the map A Z plus C, C Z plus C. So C is a complex number including infinity. Um, so this is called the Mises transformation. The amazing thing about most of transformation is that it sends circles to circles. So um, the notion of roundness, I will ask it to be invariant under this PSL 2C action. Namely, if you have a curve which is uh, not so round, then under what you apply a fractal linear transformation is still not so round. So we are keeping in mind this conformal invariance uh, in the back of our mind. So the object I will call you, tell you today is something called the, the Lovner energy. So the Lovner energy, which was associated to each of Jordan curve gamma, a number uh, which is non-negative. And in some sense, uh, the notion, this, uh, this energy will satisfy this property of the invariant under PSL 2C. Um, but the idea behind that is that it's, Defined using some probabilistic uh, meaning, probabilistic uh, notion called SLB, and which is a, a random fractal curve. So this number energy will connect to the uh, family of fractal curves, which has a certain parameter kappa, and it will connect to some asymptotic behavior of SLB kappa when kappa goes to zero. And later on, you will see that this energy will further be related to something called the Peterson quality circle. The Peterson quality circle. This is a totally a deterministic object. And uh, essentially, that for all the curves which this lambda energy is finite, if and only if this curve is a Bay Peterson quality circle. And that will link more to. Uh, Teichner theory, etc. So this is just a, um, an overview. And on the way to connect to that, I will also talk about some determinant of the function, determinant of the Neumann drop operator. Um, So today I won't be able to tell you uh, much about the proofs so about these things, but however, I just want to show you how different objects they're related to each other. And uh, hope you can enjoy that. So let me just start with the definition. In order to define this long energy, I will 
will start with a quite complicated uh, procedure, but which will allow us to connect to SLE. So for that, we start to, uh, let's consider a cord in the upper half plane. So the reason taking upper half plane is that we, we are, we'll start looking at the domains with synthetic method, which was more than two boundary points, and that always can perform an equivalent upper half plane. And of course, it just means a simple curve connecting to boundary point and here from zero to infinity. And the love of the transform, it is encoding this curve into a real value driving function. And so this is also the building block of SLE, where uh, Greg is he's giving us classes, a class of SLE uh, now. But let me just start with this. So any, uh, any initial bit of the curve, if I take my scale of scissor, I cut it out, I look at the complement of this split, it's a simply connected domain. I can choose a conformal map Okay, so for here, for me, all the conformal maps, they just mean biholomorphic function. A conformal map from the complement of the, of the set uh, to back to the upper half plane. Right, this slit has two sides after you cut it. So it will open up this slit uh, to the real line. So this red part here. And now the remainder of the cut starts somewhere. Uh, from real line. Okay, so this map is not unique. So this map, if I choose this conformal map G of Z, to be identity near infinity, and so here there should be a number here. So if I choose my conformal map to be almost like identity at infinity, and then you put your hand here, like it opened up your split by a conformal map. And then this map is uniquely determined. And this is not hard to check. And uh, so the first in expansion at infinity, the first term is just Z itself. And the second term should be a constant term, which is zero. And here, the, the, this term uh, should be a positive number. And this number is what we call the capacity, half plane capacity of this red part. So we choose, we can choose a parameterization of this curve gamma such that this number is exactly 2t. And I call this map gt. And now the tip of this point is set to a number, which is a real number that I call wt. Now for each t, so each piece there's a t that associates with it, and for each t there is also this real number of uh, wt associated with it. So w of this function is from t to wt is called the driving function. Oh, yeah. And this is the Lovelace transform. Instead of looking at this curve in the upper half plane, I just encode it into a real value function. And this range is from R plus uh, R. So already let us remark that it looks a very complicated definition. Um, like for instance, if you go up higher to this, this curve, as long as the curve is not really staying close to the real line, Actually, this number, um, this curve here is really capacitable to plus infinity. And uh, also, if I just look at locally at, at, at this part of the curve, say, in order to say that which t, which range of t that corresponds to, it will depend on the initial bit. And also, what is the value of the driving function also depends on what's going on before it. And it doesn't depend on what's happened after because it's a mapping out function. It's just uh, depending on the split that is below. So 
So in order to tell what is this Fermi function, you need to look at the whole family of the uh, uh, mapping out function. Um, but it looks complicated, complicated, but it has very good properties, which will be useful um, when you study uh, statistics mechanics models. Um, so two properties. So the additivity. Now, if I look at and I look at the curve um, G T of gamma T to infinity, if I just look at this part, the white part, under the image of G T, you get this part minus W T. It is a curve uh, starting from zero. To infinity and has driving function. S to W T plus S minus W T. It's simply the increment of the driving function. The second property, this is uh, called additivity. The second property is that if I scale my curve gamma by a number t, then it has the drive function t to t times wc minus 2t. So they are very explicit uh, if you do this two transformation. And already, if you Notice that if I take the driving function to be Brownian motion, then Brownian motion will be invariant under these two operations. Let me just give you an example. Um, so when W is just constant function zero, what you get is have, uh, this straight line. So when w is equal to square root of kappa times Brownian motion, this is a standard one-dimensional Brownian motion, and kappa is a number uh, positive, well, zero. And there is actually a phase transition. This is by um, Stephen Rosa and other stuff. To show that when kappa is between zero and four, you get almost surely a simple curve. When kappa is in between um, four and eight. So here, I only explain how you get from a simple curve to a driving function. But actually, one can also recover the driving function from the driving function, the curve, the original curve. But not all the continuous driving function will give you a curve. So is it, that would be in a more general setup. We won't be using it just today. Um, but just to let you know that when kappa is larger, the, the driving function becomes rougher. And what you get is the, a curve which is touching itself. And the, uh, the conformal map is defined in the outside of the in the, in the connected component of the infinity. In the last case, when kappa is greater than eight, uh, you get almost surely a phase steady curve. Phase steady. All right, so, okay, why Lozner transform uh, is useful? So here, um, for those who are not probabilists, you, know, you probably still have heard about Brownian motion. So Brownian motion has uh, all this universality property. Yes, the unique possible. This is the only possible daily limit of uh, any kind of a uh, random walk under nice uh, second moment conditions. And uh, so it, it it appears like everywhere. And because of the universality. Of the Brownian motion, you get the universality of SLE. 
And uh, uh, that's why SLE has been proved uh, to be the scaling limit in many setting finance models. And uh, uh, just to name a few that like easy for easy model. So in general, the setup is that if you have any uh, lattice model, which in the scaling limit having nice uh, conformal invariant property, say if I take the thing to be negative, Give me that you just have two colors of the thing. And if I uh, assign the negative value on one side and the positive value on the other side, uh, it will force a certain type of an interface in between. Uh, if you look at the cluster of, between the negative cluster and the positive cluster. And uh, if there's a nice conformally various uh, property underlying, then the scale limit has to be an SLE. And all that is coming actually hidden behind the universality of the ground motion uh, here. So what it has to do with uh, the Lovner energy is let me finally can define the Lovner energy. This is a deterministic quantity that if I have a Jordan curve, I think a, a simple course first inside the simply connected domain B, connecting A to B, say from A to B. I will first uniformize uh, the C to the upper half plane uh, to a curve like this, a formal map. And if I have a curve in the upper half plane, I can write down its driving function. And I define the Lovner energy of this curve gamma inside B, say B to be the Lovner, to be the Dirichlet energy where W is the driving function Here, phi is not unique. Uh, phi is a map which will send uh, a to zero, b to infinity. Uh, but phi is not unique. You still have a degree of freedom, which is by scaling. But however, uh, because of this property, under the scaling, the driving function will change in this explicit way. And one can check that the Dirichlet energy doesn't change. What is it has something to do with the Brownian motion itself is that uh, in probability theory, there's a, something called the Schroeder theorem, which was saying that this Dirichlet energy is the action function of the Brownian motion and the, is also the large deviation rate function. So, heuristically, Schroeder theorem is saying that the probability of a small multiple of Brownian motion. Stay close to a given function w is decaying when kappa goes to zero, uh, like exponential minus the Dirichlet energy of w divided by that. Right, when we take kappa to be very small, this probability is very, very small. If uh, w is not a zero function, and how small that is, is is decaying always exponentially fast if uh, the Dirichlet energy of w is finite, and if the Dirichlet energy of w is not finite, then this will be even faster than the exponential decay. So here, uh, there are many things to be made precise. What does being close mean, and what does this asymptotic mean? Um, but uh, this is the uh, Maybe good to have this mental picture, sugar theorem. But what if 
if I translate that directly to SLE, so it's a lot of technical uh, details that could be filled in, um, but we can believe that the probability of SLE kappa the close to a pair of gamma is also decaying when kappa goes to zero plus um, to exponential minus the Lovner energy of gamma L for Lovner energy uh, divided by kappa. So this is um third integral from And we could prove this uh, closeness in the sense of the house of system. Uh, and so to just draw a picture, so in the unit disk, if I'm giving you a curve, gamma, and uh, the probability of SLE kappa stay close to this green curve, uh, its probability is decaying like the long energy of gamma when kappa goes to zero. So finally, I'm coming to the bottom third case. So this is uh, a definition to the center order. So if you have a Jordan curve, now I take the point on it, I call it the root of the Jordan curve. And uh, let me see, let's say like the cut gamma is parameterized by zero one. The ring is here. So zero is identified with one. Um, then you have the complement of gamma zero and gamma epsilon. It is a simply connected domain. The Riemann sphere, I just cut it up, this green part. So I can talk about the limit when I can go to zero of the Lovner energy in the domain E hat when I take out gamma or epsilon, the remainder for this white curve is a, a chord in the complement of the green part. Now I'm letting epsilon go to zero. And this limit, this is called uh, the loop energy uh, rooted at gamma zero. And this limit exists in fact because when epsilon goes to zero, this uh, is an increasing limit. So this is a number which is belonging to the infinity. All right, so now the question. is finally, like I'm going to give you what I promised that this, this is a right, uh, quantity to measure the roundness. Now let me just take the zero in here. That first of all, this loop energy does not depend on this uh, root, the phase where it takes the limit. Secondly, um, this is equal to zero if it only has gamma in a circle. Thirdly, we have a transformation. Uh, this invariance is almost for free because uh, the 
codal energy is defined using uh, conformal invariant. Uh, the second one is also not hard to check, maybe this direction is gamma is a circle. Uh, this is zero. If you want to check the case, if you have an infinite line, how would you take the So let's say I root it at infinity. Uh, this is gamma epsilon, this is gamma zero. And the remainder of the class uh, is having zero energy. And if you take the epsilon goes to zero, again goes to uh, infinity, then you get the zero. The other direction is also true. Um, the last thing is that if the local energy of gamma is finite, then it implies that gamma is a corner circle. Uh, however, the other direction is not sure. And uh, this independence of this uh, root. Uh, I will explain more about what is quantum circle and why. I will not explain the original proof of this result, but uh, I will give you an equivalent description of this local energy, uh, then where you can see the invariance of the root uh, coming for free. Actually, when we, when Stetler first introduced this, uh, when, when I told him what is this uh, codal energy, I would define it for a chord, and he immediately asked me, oh, what is the, uh, what happens if you consider a Jordan curve and you define it this way, whether that would be interesting? And uh, that immediately got my attention. And we worked uh, pretty hard to get the first uh, identity is to show that it doesn't actually depend on the root. Uh, at that time, as I can understand it, I it's pretty clean. I, I was really shocked by this uh, independence of the root. Uh, because if you look at this definition, even like look at the chord here, just for fixed epsilon, in order to write down its driving function, the capacity parameterization starts from zero from this side and it goes to plus infinity when I come to this side. And it looks like uh, the energy of this part of the curve, usually energy of the guiding function coming from this part of the curve, uh, should matter really a lot. But uh, in the end, it actually doesn't. And it just says that if I move this point to the other point, any part of the loop there actually plays, plays a similar role. And that it has intrigued us uh, for a long time and to see why this is, so there are so many, so many symmetries in, also, like get to know that what are the curves we, where, for which this energy is finite, you already see that it's sitting inside some class of a quasi circle. But however, not all quasi circles are actually um, finite level energy. Uh, actually, we can also show that this gamma is a quasi circle and rectifiable. Meaning that the, and if gamma is smooth. Is the energy finite? Yeah, if a C infinity smooth, if it's a C three half plus epsilon smooth, then and if it's a quasi circle where that constant is very close to one, is it also no, no. You can have a quasi circle for so it's rectifiable, it shows it's the half of dimension has to be one. And if a quasi circle oh, is a, it doesn't sure. need to be, yeah. Um and also that's also another reason that one really need to think about uh, this. Finite energy curve as a kappa goes to zero semi-classical limit of the SLE. Uh, in fact, SLE kappa has almost surely on um, the house of dimension one plus kappa over a. And here we are looking at the class of curves. They are somehow related to SLE, but still um, it's really so exhibiting some kappa goes to zero behavior. 
a bit busy. Um, okay, now I think the final, now I'm going to answer those, all those questions. And, uh, okay, the first one is going to explain why it doesn't depend on the root, but for a smaller class. So if gamma is smooth, then the Lovelace energy of gamma smooth Jordan curve. So from, from now on, I will only talk about Jordan curve. Although its definition comes from photo This is the lambda energy of gamma can be written as 12 times this functional as they would this. Where H gamma. Okay, this can go to draw a picture here. Well, I have a smooth curve gamma on the green sphere. I will put a round metric. Uh, if you want it written in a uh, Complex plane with this metric. And now the complement of gamma, I call this D1 and D2. Uh, there is a, a Laplace operator. Laplace, you can define Laplace for any uh, Riemannian manifold. Um, Laplace Beltranian operator, which acts on a function with zero uh, boundary value. So this is a Dirichlet. Dirichlet Laplace. I will define this functional as log determinant of the Laplace. So this is the Laplace on the whole sphere minus log the area S2 minus log that of the Laplace in D1. Minus log that Laplacian in D2. And they all depend on the, the metric itself and depends on gamma because D1 and D2 um, depends on gamma. So here I use something called this uh, determinant, it's for zeta regularized determinant. And uh, how that is defined. So essentially what, what you want to do the determinant is that you do look at the spectrum of the Laplacian. You want to take uh, maybe take the minus, so the Laplacian usually has, um, we take the Laplacian with, with, the, with the positive spectrum and you want to take the product of uh, all the uh, data values. And here, which doesn't make sense, but uh, there's a way to make sense of the determinant uh, log determinant is using introducing a data function. Uh, the Riemann data function you have one over n to the power s to sum up. Instead of n, you put the lambda n or the spectrum in the data function. And there is a certain way to regularize the determinant uh, in order for this to be well defined. And here I need a step to be smooth in order to make this determinant. Uh, well defined. Actually, there are some assumptions 
on the regularity of the domain order to talk about uh, this guy. So here, um, the re also, okay, this expression has another expression. This is also equal to the uh, determinant of a Neumann jump operator uh, minus the uh, of the length. So the role played by this length of gamma and also the log of the area of the sphere is in also some technical part when when defined this uh, determinant of Laplacian because this is a Laplacian with type of kernel um, actually normalizing somewhere. So these are not important terms. Um, the, the most important thing is that it is related to some spectrum uh, theory about behind this uh, domain. And here, this is who this this guy. Uh, this is an operator to start with a function of smooths on the set and uh, you map to another function um, that is smooths on the cut and defines as. If I have a function h living on this curve, and I look at the harmonic extension, this is called uh, h plus is it h minus harmonic extension to the two sides. And uh, to take the then to the normal derivative the exterior normal derivative depending on which side that you yeah. okay here we, so this this that you see here is uh working uh um free blender. So this is purely a uh, operator derived uh, thing. Um, in some sense, uh, in some sense here you can think of this Laplacian on the whole sphere. If I write in the block matrix, uh, where there is a part of a block which uh, uh, there are functions living in a plus, functions living in a minus, and function uh, which is harmonic in a plus and a minus. So the question, uh, if you act the functions on B plus with zero boundary condition, and all the functions that are on the green sphere uh, can be decomposed into the sum of the uh, three uh, functions: zero boundary in B plus, zero boundary in B minus, and the functions in harmonic uh, in the complement of the curve. And here, what you get, this is exactly. The Dirichlet Laplacian in B plus. Here there were zero. This block, and th these three vectors, these three spectra are orthogonal to each other. And here this is Laplacian B minus. And the last block is this Newman jump operator. Um, 
So therefore, you, you do expect that the determinant of uh, the passion equals the determinant of the uh, 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 s square the sphere uh, equals the determinant of the uh, passion and the the first one, the second one, and the last one. Uh, and here it they also express in terms of divided. Okay, so here so far I just explained that how lovely energy can be written in terms of determinants of the passion. I didn't tell you why. Um, so uh, the way that how this result is proved is the hardest part is to guess the identity and then the actual proof of it uh, is to take a one representation of so one way to write out in a nicer more explicit way and to check this identity holds for uh, some example curves and doing nice approximation etc but the way how i guess this result was uh based on some this come with some faith about resulting random component geometry where it is some to say that Love the energy being the large deviation rate function of SLE. And there is a certain coupling between SLE with the Gaussian P field in the complement of the curve. And uh, the right hand side should be the large deviation rate function of the Gaussian P field. Um, so that, that's, and that, uh, so that's related to some quantum, uh, the volume, uh, the volume of quantum disk, et cetera, which was the recent <coughs> Actually, by uh, uh, Morris and Nina. Uh, but however, like I, so here we, I'm just showing you that okay, the lambda energy actually is related to this log determinant of Laplace, which has several uh, ways to express this, uh, either using determinant of Laplace or uh, determinant of uh, this Neumann jump operator. Once we have this uh, identity here, at least you can see that there's no root at all on the right hand side. Uh, but however, this is the identity for smooth curves, which is uh, um, not yet uh, satisfactory. But we can actually using this uh, expression, and uh, essentially you just need to compare the log determinant of the uh, uh, Laplace inside D1 and D2 with the one in the complement of the circle. Uh, we can also show that just ex expanding this identity, the love and energy of gamma can be written in a very simple way. That if you have set gamma, I will look at two conformal maps F from the inside to inside of the set gamma, B, e, another conformal map from outside to outside. This is from D, this is D from D star. Conform, both are conformal. And the lumen energy is simply this is reflected in Euclidean area measure. How many derivatives are there on top? I, I uh, two, of two of them. And one. And one of that. Yeah, this is the uh, three schwab here. Uh, so, so this one is simply expanding this uh, expression using something called Polyapple formula, uh, which gives you really explicitly this number. And here, this is with no 
or regularity adoption. Uh, here, uh, essentially, what you do is to assume the curve is smooth, you get this identity, then approximate uh, all these curves by smooth curves, you get identity for any Jordan curve. So it's just that you somehow you get around of the, this uh, regularity assumption because all these terms they are well defined for any uh, Jordan curve. So here, um, it's not always, it's always not always finite. Right. So here, um, it's kind of expressing a certain integrability of the fish function, down to fish function. And, um, and this class actually has been studied. So studied by uh, Tekla Jones. Recently, more written by Bishop and actually many, many other people since the 80s. And it says this gamma for, the, for which the right hand side is finite. They call everything here behind the second curve. They call S1, not gamma. They're saying that lambda entry equals to this, they call universal Liouville action. Um, The big Peterson quasi circle. And this class of quasi circles has a, a tons of other equivalent descriptions. So, first, uh, that this guy is finite is actually only also is equivalent to if you just that require this. Think about the other term. It's equivalent to uh, this thing is finite, just half of it. Uh, also equivalent to um, the integral of the Schwarzschild of that. Schwarzschild is a term which involves the third derivative of f. Schwarzschild of f is zero. If and only f f is Lebesgue. Um, Take one hundred. It's a quadratic uh, differential, so you can multiply by inverse of the metric, uh, hyperbolic, hyperbolic metric. Uh, this is finite. And uh, there are other uh, descriptions. Maybe some of the you would, uh, which I also like very much. It's a very recent work by Chris Bishop who, who shows that if a curve gamma is the Peterson, but remember that so this is the Peterson also if and only if uh, the lambda energy is finite. So the S1 is uh, the same as the Lovna energy, is the uh, planet the Peterson, and the Lovna energy is PSL2C invariant. And remember that uh, the isometry of the hyperbolic street space, okay, if you have a complex plane, you, you fill up uh, by the hyperbolic street space, and this is the same as the PSL. Group in the sense that uh, if any isometry of the uh, H3, uh, it's isometry group. If, if you look at the boundary value, it's the element in the Mobius group, vice versa. Um, so it would be very nice to, to characterize this uh, gamma, which is a uh, Peterson, which is a case of the invariant quantity in terms of uh, uh, something in hyperbolic free space. It is what we call the holographic principle. Okay, so this is the theorem by Bishop. 
we show that um, gamma is a Peterson. You can only ask um, gamma about a minimal surface. Surface sigma uh, with curvature, total curvature infinite. Okay, so what is uh, so being a minimal surface, I just say that the principal curvatures are taking opposite sign with the same magnitude, they're mean curvature is zero. So at each point, uh, the principal curvature is say k and minus k. And if you take the integral of the principal curvature. If it's a the semi sphere, then it's a, the principal curvature is always zero. It corresponds to the boundary to be a circle. And uh, if you have this, so here if you take just the integral of this area in the hyperbolic space, this area is always infinite because it comes to the boundary. But however, here it's saying that the curvature decays to zero um, quickly enough so that uh, this. Integral curvature uh, is finite, and this is equivalent to the boundary of the sphere. Um, however, this is not really a quantitative. It's not saying that if the local energy comes that relates to this, and they're not actually they're, they're actually they're not equal. And yeah. aren't there any bounds like depending in relation between them? Does one bound the other? Uh, not no. Um. And also, one thing is that the, the minimal surface are not unique for each of Jordan curves. Even if you ask it to be a minimal disk, it's not always unique. But uh, I, there's not no bound them. Okay, so so uh, one last thing I want to say is that uh, this Lovner energy is in fact uh, not only characterizing this class of big Peters and quasi circles. Um, but also a fundamental quantity in the space of the Peters and quality circles. Um, I would just start saying in words that the space of all the Peters and quality circles, they actually form infinite dimensional Hilbert manifolds. And uh, on, on which you can do inner products and uh, uh, you can do, you can do, it, it's a Riemannian manifold and, uh, and where there's also a natural, a complex structure, which arises from their embedding. And there's a lot of structure on it. And uh, in fact, it was shown to be a, also a Kähler, Kähler uh, manifold for which this uh, Liouville action, this uh, is why the right hand side is the Kähler potential for that metric. And that's what that metric reminiscent to the Big Peterson metric in fact in the spaces. Uh, that's why the name, um, but however, and all that I didn't have the time to say, but however, it's saying that actually there's a lot of structure in the space of the Bay Peterson quality circle, which is still a mysterious thing to me, knowing that the love energy originally comes from SLE, where it started to have it's kind of measuring how far, how likely SLE has had to stay close to this curve. And the definition is very complicated. I need to map out the curve little by little to look at where the driving function is and take the Dirichlet energy and take the limit to define the love and energy. Somehow it is equal to a very fundamental quantity on the space of the big Peterson quality circle that's the Taylor potential there. Um, and also even just looking at the expression itself is looks extremely simple. You just need to look at two conformal maps from inside the disk to outside of inside of curve and outside of this outside of the curve you are able to compute what this love energy is um and because of this new link of the the space of the peterson quality circle with the link with the uh, uh love and energy and its connection to sle actually we, we have been exploring a lot of the connection between and 
using ideas from random control majority to show uh, new results for the regular voice circle. But however, today I just wanted to show you these uh, many different things. They're actually connected to each other and it's really uh, something I'm fascinated about. Okay, thank you for your attention.